Okay, I see I hear a thing, but you can hear me if you can hear okay. Um, so I thought I would talk for a little bit about my background um, and I guess how I got to this place, which despite the fact that I have been, I guess, relatively focused, like I always wanted to do education policy in particular, not just education, and I am doing education policy, um, I never thought I would do this particular position. I don't think I even knew that this particular position was a thing. Um, and uh, so I'll talk a little bit about how, even though you know you can have a general sense of what you want to do, um, there's some choices and things that come in the way that allow you different opportunities, um, and that have allowed me the chance to have the privilege of doing what I'm doing now, which is fantastic. Um, so I did always want to be in education. I wanted to be a teacher at first when I was in high school, and um, I always loved. You know, I say I feel like I'm still in some ways a teacher, because when you do public policy, you're always teaching and you're kind of explaining new concepts to people. So I think being in education, that's something we can all appreciate. There's, a, I think, a real um, juxtaposition between public policy and education just naturally, because you're always meeting people. They have short attention spans. They may not be familiar with the content and you're trying to get them to understand certain things um, and to act upon them. So I see that as being really relevant to what I do every day. Um, having said that, when I start, when I was in high school, I actually realized there was a lot of stuff that happened in the K-12 classroom that had nothing to do with what the teacher controlled, like what time the school day started, what the students were wearing, um, you know, actually the textbooks that we used, all of that was like someone else. So I kept asking like, well, who decides that? Who decides that? And they said, well, that's the policy. And I was like, well, I want to do the policy part, right? <laughs> I, I care about the education, but this stuff matters and it really shapes um, students' lives. So I had in this, in my mind, like, I want to do policy. I want to do education policy. So I didn't really know like how you get there, but I figured I need to major in something related to education or policy. Well, like many people, I had a lot of different interests. At first it was English, and then I was like, man, you have to write a lot. Um, and I, <laughs> I got like my first, so I'll talk about some of the ch I mean, challenges. I, I've been a very uh, blessed person and had a lot of um, wonderful privileges in my life, so I will just uh, start with that and that you can do a lot of the right things and part of the reason I got into this is because I felt like from a policy standpoint people in my high school um, which you know it wasn't like a bad high school but probably not the high school you would choose to send your students to um, my parents had an interesting parenting philosophy so chose to send me to this high school but um, there were things that until I got to Vanderbilt I didn't realize were normal like I thought everybody had to wear clear backpacks to school and they were like why would you have a clear backpack and I'm like so they could see if you have a gun obviously <laughs> <laughs> like, I literally didn't realize that Jansen made like non-clear backpack. I'm like, what are these backpacks that are, you can't see through? Um, so anyway, so there were a lot of fr um, my friends from high school and stuff that um, I felt like were just as brilliant as I was, but just didn't end up on a path to go to college or really have any clear plans after high school. And I didn't feel like it was their fault. I felt like we just didn't provide like I came from a family that provided a lot of extra support and I'm a nerd by heart. And so a lot of things that um, I was like buying US News and World Report with my allowance in sixth grade instead of, you know, whatever else. So I'm just a particular kind of person, but realizing that everybody's not that particular kind of person, which has its pros and cons. You can ask my husband that uh, there are big good points to that and bad points to that, um, that a lot of just the environmental factors went into whether or not people were successful. So. I felt like that's not really fair, right? Like it's not fair that depending on where you happen to end up, you could be very personally um, ambitious, very smart as an individual and still kind of not be allowed success in your life. So wanted to, felt like I wanted to do something about that and use whatever I could to, to be on the path to do something about it. So I got to college and um, I thought I was like something. I went to Vanderbilt, but came from this high school that wasn't you know, that great, but I never really, people talk about um, uh, having um, anxiety or whatever, I can't remember the name of it, but when students come to a college and that they're like scared of the, I didn't have that. I was very bold and was like, oh, but I did have a faculty member who was like, so I bet you think you're a good writer. <laughs> And that was when I decided I'm probably not an English major. Um, and but it was very informative and instructive in realizing that the um, rigor and the uh, uh, educational environment of my high school just wasn't the same as probably some of the other students. It didn't really 
deter me necessarily, but it was a reality. Um, so I had that, I was interested in history, I thought about triple majoring, and then thought that's not a good idea. Um, and so anyway, ended up majoring in political science and secondary education. Um, I now tell people it doesn't really matter all of that much because um, I learned more in an internship one summer, which is why I'm a huge fan of internships, than I did in four years of political science at Vanderbilt University. Great program, nothing wrong with the program, but the real world experience, what I learned in the textbooks about how a bill becomes a law, and then you're in DC, and you're actually there, and you see like, oh, it's not gonna, I don't even know if it goes in the hopper. Like, I don't know who puts it in the hopper, but that is not an integral part of <laughs> the bill making process. What is an integral part of the bill making process is the political parties and um, the committee that you're on. I realize the committee has way more to do, or at least it used to, and now, in DC, it actually doesn't matter at all. All the rules are out <laughs> the window <laughs> because it's different than even when I was an intern, um, you know, a decade ago or, or more. Um, so in, in any case, so that um, led me to um, decide that I really did want to move to DC. I did this internship, but I also got my teaching certification because I had this passion for teaching and I wasn't sure, I mean a lot of students are not sure how to make the jump from, I'm interested in teaching, I love being in the classroom, but I want to do education policy, I don't know how to make the jump. Unfortunately, I don't really have great advice about it. There are some like programs and stuff that do it, but mine was somewhat um, random. I did an internship in DC. I got certified to teach K-12 social studies. I loved teaching. Um, I really, really thought seriously for a long time until my certification expired about like leaving policy and going back into the, um, into the classroom um, and tried to figure out if there's some charter school that would let me work like half time on the hill and half time teaching. And there just, there wasn't, uh, <laughs> it didn't exist um, there. Uh, so, in any case, I had the teaching certification. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So after college, I did an internship in D.C. and had this wonderful experience and fell in love with Washington, D.C. It's just such a vibrant place for young people in particular, and I just remember being on the metro in D.C. and seeing all these, like, staffers with their Blackberries, being like, I want to be a staffer with a Blackberry. <laughs> and um, then, like, five years later, I was like, why did I want to do this? <laughs> this is not the, not the thing. Um, in any case, uh, just the vibrancy of the city and how welcoming it was to elevating young people is either, that was encouraging to me. So I had already planned to go to graduate school. Um, I, as you heard, I went to Harvard for my master's degree, um, which was great. It was a wonderful experience. Harvard's a great place, uh, other than the fact that Boston's pretty racist. It was like a really good experience at Harvard itself. And that I'm, I'm throwing in these things because I feel like we often talk about the successful parts of it, and it sounds like um, and Harvard was a wonderful place, but being a black person from the South in the city of Boston was not fun. Um, and I got called the N-word for the first time in my life, like in a real way. Um, and I mean, you know, again, you move on and I'm okay, but it's not like a rosy picture. It was very cold as well. I lived previously in Atlanta and Nashville, okay? I'd never seen snow seriously before. I think it snowed one time in Nashville and I was like, oh, that's so cool. And it like melted as soon as it got on the ground. And going to Boston was um, a wake up call in that way. Um, the other thing though was I didn't plan to go to Boston. I had actually planned to stay at Vanderbilt and get my master's degree through my undergrad institution. Had a terrible breakup, a really bad breakup with my boyfriend at the time. And I thought it was the end of my world. And I like just wanted to get away. So I applied to Harvard. I was like, well, if I get into Harvard, I'll just go. And I was like, oh shit, I got into Harvard. <laughs> so <laughs> like, I just went. And, um, and you know, again, I very, I had a very good situation. Like, you know, it's can't lose in that, in that place. But I didn't initially end up um, wanting to go there. And it was a wonderful thing just to be away from that environment in a completely different place. So after Harvard, I had this decision to make about whether I was, what was I going to do then? Decided to, that I wanted to try to get a job. I really wanted to work on the Hill in DC. And I had my congresswoman that I worked for in the internship. But unfortunately, she did not win her re-election campaign. So that's fine. You know, you know people and you kind of meet and it, but it's, it's hard to get a, I mean, an entry level job on the Hill. It, it doesn't pay much. You do really have to know people. Um, I had a great internship opportunity, but um, I did get this job working for this advisory committee that focused on uh, the, the 
affordability issues and access is issues for low and moderate income students. So it was like an extension of grad school a little bit, this advisory committee. It doesn't exist anymore. It was sunset, the executive director made somebody mad and so the committee <laughs> ceased to exist, which is again how things work in that environment. But um, I was working for this committee because I couldn't quite get a job on the Hill and I figured like this would give me an entree in doing this research, advising Congress. Um, on different issues, and it was a great um, opportunity to be able to get there. Uh, and that was like 2007, and the election was starting to heat up, and I was kind of like, well, you know, John Edwards is going to win this because, you know, Democrats um, from the South um, and attractive white men from the South, that's who wins presidential elections, right? Like, so I was thinking that's going to happen. I don't know anybody. It just, it wasn't even a thought in my mind that Barack Hussein Obama was going to be president of the United States. Like somebody mentioned it at a party one time, or like a watch party, and I was like, his middle name is Hussein. Like, there's just no way that this is going to happen. So now I realize Anything can happen, <laughs> especially now I realize anything can happen. Um, and you know, you think you know who is electable and not, and that is not always what ends up being the case. But anyway, I went about doing my job. I knocked on doors for Barack Obama, but I did not know anybody inside. I did not have any like inside connections. I happened to live in Northern Virginia, which was then a swing state, but didn't really, I mean, I, again, did my little local thing, but didn't really know anyone. But the committee that I worked for had, um, the structure was there were members who were appointed by Congress and by the Secretary of Education. And so I was a staff person, you know, like the committee would write these reports and I was a staff person that actually did the research for the reports that the committee would put out. And so the committee had like 11 members, but they all have full-time jobs. So you know how those things work, right? The staff people do the work, which is fine. That's what I signed up for. I loved it. Um, and we had a lot of autonomy, like we would write these reports about how to simplify the FAFSA or how to make transfer better. And they would be like 100 page reports and thoroughly researched and documented. And we would, my, per, my job was to like send the final versions to the committee and get any edits and, you know, incorporate them. And you would send it to the members and it'd be like full of facts and figures and all this stuff and recommendations. They'd be like, looks good. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> very minimal, um, you know, engagement, or, or maybe just we did that great of a job. Um, but there was this one member of the committee who he was the only person who would ever send back substantive edits. And his edits were like, you know, your x axis on page 54 needs to be adjusted in these increments. I mean, it was like he was that one person that, again, everybody else would be looks great, can't wait, tell me when the release is. And he would have like all these things. And you use the word cost when you mean price. And to this day, when I see in higher education cost, <laughs> when people mean price, I'm like, oh, it mean, they don't mean cost, they mean price. Um, because he used to do that. So anyway, that was him. He got named the higher education advisor to Barack Obama's first secretary of education, Arnie Duncan. And he had worked in the Clinton administration. He was very well connected. He was on the transition team. So I knew he was like a big muckety muck. And he was that one person that always said stuff. So one day he just called up and said, I've been named um, the education advisor or higher education advisor. So I'm going to have to resign my position on the committee because I can't advise myself. Makes sense. We'll start the process of like getting a new member appointed. About two weeks later, he emails and says, I've met this man like twice. Like he knows me through me sending him emails and press clips and like memos, but doesn't like know me. Um, two weeks later, he's like, can you come and help in the office? There's nobody here. It's um, basically, you know, the beginning parts of administrations, you're trying to staff up. Um, back in those days, you did a lot of vetting for people. So it took a long time to get people on board. Like if you had unpaid parking tickets or, you know, you didn't pay your nanny's taxes. You had to like rectify all that stuff before you actually started. So there weren't a lot of people working there. I think when he, he was the only higher ed specific person that was working for the, as a political appointee to the secretary of education at the time. Um, and he was just like, I just need help. He was like, I need all kind of help. I need administrative help. I need um, substantive help. I need whatever you can do. And I had been there for a couple years at this point, and I'm kind of like rising, and I got a promotion, and they were about to put me in the corner office, and I was gonna have like some management responsibility. So I was like feeling myself just, you know, a little bit, you know, out of grad school, working in DC, and networked and met people. Um, and what he was like asking me to do was basically to come and work in a cube and answer his emails and schedule meetings. And I was like, man, do I, and, and for like a little bit less pay than I was currently making. 
Um, but it was for Barack Obama, like tangentially. You know, it was for him, for the secretary, and then for Barack Obama. So I was like, yes, I want to work for Barack Obama. <laughs> like, if, if it's sweeping floors for Barack Obama, like I'm going to work for Barack Obama. So, um, the, I mean, that was how I got in to that world. It was somewhat random, but I realized, you know, if I, he must have seen something at that time, you know, that I was there. And I realized that was the last, I think, position that I ever applied for that I got um, and or I didn't actually apply like that was the last time that from there I realized people are always watching you and I um, he was watching me and I had no idea um, and so I was thankful that I had a good I guess back story in some way that he felt like I could do a good job but he only asked me to be there temporarily he was like look there are people who are lined up from this campaign who were not at Harvard uh, getting a master's degree over the past, while you were, you know, they were actually in South Carolina, in Michigan, sleeping on people's couches, knocking on doors, like stuff you weren't doing. And those people have like in uh, politics, usually those are the people that get the entry level jobs, not, you know, folks who had like cushy government, you know, appointments to do studies and commission reports, right? Um, so I was like, that's fine. He's always like, this is just a temporary thing. Just need you to schedule my meetings for a little while. Um, you will have the context. If I bring somebody right away from the campaign, they won't know who these folks are. They won't know who's important or not. At the time, President Obama was trying to do a lot of stuff in higher education. The stimulus was, they were trying to get the stimulus off the ground. They were trying to change over the lending system. There was all this stuff happening and he was like the only person that worked there. There was no undersecretary yet. There was no chief of staff yet and none of the assistant secretaries had been named. So there was just a lot of incoming. And so in addition to just kind of helping him um, from an administrative standpoint, he was like, I also get a lot of emails. He was like, I get all these emails and everything that's not about us getting Pell Grants in the stimulus or changing over to direct lending, I cannot, I don't have the bandwidth to deal with. So can you just, so he literally routed all of his emails that were not about those things to me. And I had to like work through them. So it was like trial by fire. I learned everything there was to know about post-secondary education at the Department of Education. I could probably tell you all of the programs from Title III to Title V to Title VII international programs, regulatory parts of the Office of Post-Secondary Education, federal student aid. All of that stuff was routed to me to try to figure out. And my job was just to tee things up for decisions for him. And so again, that was like the first entree. And then from there, I um, met people that worked at the White House um, and um, did that for a year and a half, which felt like four years, and then um, left there, went to Lumina Foundation. And we'll say along the way, so I know I'm making it sound like, oh, I just fell into this thing, I just fell into this thing. That first decision to like not um, stay at the advisory committee was pretty difficult because I was moving up and he was basically asking me to be his secretary with no clearly defined role. I didn't even have a title for the first couple of months. Um, he said it was gonna be temporary and then I basically like begged to stay on after I had kind of proven that I could be of value. Um, and the advisory committee, I didn't know it was gonna be sunset at the time. It was, um, I mean, again, I wasn't, I was only, it was just me by myself. So I wasn't like making this decision thinking, oh, I might leave my children hungry or something like that. So I totally recognized that that was a kind of place of privilege to be able to make that kind of sacrifice. But it was a pretty sure thing. It's like, you're gonna get a promotion, you're gonna be a director, you're gonna make 10,000 more dollars. And this guy is like saying that you can work in a cubicle um, from like 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., which is more or less the hours daily um, for like less money and no title and no certainty of it leading to anything in particular. Um, and I did, and I was thankful for that. Um, but then when I got there, you know, you other people come on and there's one of the most frustrating things about those kinds of jobs um, that I've taken with me and just tried to find places where this is not the environment and I try not to create these kinds of environments. It can be very cutthroat. So you get there and people are very, um, they're jockeying for their own spot, right? So you've got somebody that's fresh off the, I remember the, talking to people and they were like, oh, where, what state did you work in? And I was like, I, I didn't work in any state. I just knew Bob from, <laughs> from, from they were like, wait, you had a job already? And like, you got this job and you were not making $20,000. 
sleeping on people's couches and you get to be here like doing all these things. So there was a lot of that. Some of those people are my best friends now. But at, definitely at the beginning, it was very much uncomfortable. Um, the other thing that happens in a new administration is that uh, when people come on, they each have their own vision of what they would like to see happen. So, you know, you have the president who theoretically sets the vision for what he would like to see happen for the country. And then you have the secretary of education who's advising the president. Those two people, um, it's so different right now. I can't believe these presidential people have all these plans for higher education. Their plans were like increase Pell. <laughs> That was like the plan for higher education and change the lending system. So um, at the time, there was a lot of room for other people to insert what they would like to see happen. And so the first people that are there have a lot of power over that. And then you have the next wave that comes in and they have a little bit more. And then there's another wave of people that comes in that they're like, OK, you're, you're coming in four months late. We've already determined what we're going to do. There's really not that much space for, you know, freelancing at this point because we've already set the path but I'm a college president and I am used to being able to tell people no offense, <laughs> but you know how your, your colleagues can be. And so that was um, extraordinarily difficult, especially as a you know, 20 something who, I mean, I now realize how this seems, but you're a 20 something who doesn't know anything, who has a master's degree, who is like working all day and you're gonna tell me that this is the policy direction that we're going to go into. Um, which is not what you're trying to say. You're just trying to say, well, no, that's what so-and-so told me that I have to say that we already have the stuff that's lined up and ready to go. So um, it was, there were times when I felt um, not like I was out of my depth, but that I was like super disrespected. Like people would come in. I remember there was a guy who came in and wouldn't answer my emails. Um, he started later and like we had done all this work and I wanted nothing more than to like have him come in for me to brief him and for him to like carry it on. And he was, I think, resentful that he had to talk to somebody that was not a college president who didn't have a PhD and literally wouldn't answer my emails. And I was like, I went to my boss and I was just like, I've been like literally doing all this work for him. I've been preparing stuff. I'm looking forward to being able to brief him and come on. And she was like, well, fine, just stop doing the work. I was like, really? She's like, yeah, he'll realize that he needs to talk to you when the work stops getting done. So I, I just stopped doing all the work that was related to that area. And the first meeting they went to where people were not prepared and they didn't have any background, they were like, well, where's the kid? And I was like, oh, OK, now he wants to talk to me and, and understand what's going on. Um, I'm going to cut the story off here because there's a lot of other fun little stories that I could share, but I would much rather hear your questions and figure out um, what would be helpful to share. Uh, but the, I guess the thing that I would kind of end with is I ended up here not, again, not ever knowing that this was a possibility. Um, I worked with somebody on the, um, another kind of challenging moment was I worked on the transition team for the Hillary Clinton campaign. So there's the campaign and then there's the transition. And I guess uh, after the Obama 2012 election, they wrote a law that said transitions could start earlier for national security reasons. It's just too much for somebody to try to come in um, between November and January to learn everything there is to know and to try to set up a government. So they could start the transition, I think, as early as September. So both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, the two major party candidates, are allowed space um, and a small budget to have a transition team. Um, and so we were in the same office building. We were on one floor, the Trump people with Chris Christie were on another floor. And um, our job was to set up the incoming government for the new administration, which whoever won. And of course, we knew we were gonna win because obviously what, you know, that was what everybody thought was going to happen. And so we're setting up to get ready. I had taken a leave of absence from Lumina at the time um, to work on this transition team. I think they thought I was gonna leave and work in a new administration. I thought maybe I would leave and work in the new administration. You're just going in thinking one thing. And then Wednesday after the election, it was like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> we did not receive instructions for this scenario. I don't know what is going on. Don't know what to do. Um, thankfully, I had a really great mentor. Um, at, so before I took the job on the transition team, I was planning to quit my job and work on the transition team. And this mentor said, girl, don't quit your job. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? And she said, you ask for a leave of absence because this is, a, this is a temporary appointment. You think there might be another appointment after this. You do not know 
what is going to happen. Um, there could be a job. There could be a job you don't want. You've already worked in one administration. You know what the different options are. You know that there are some things that you probably don't want to do. So you take a leave of absence, and then after that, you can figure out what it is you want to do. And I was like, well, they do that. And she was like, well, you don't know until you ask. So I asked, and they were happy to have me take a leave of absence because they didn't want me to leave Lumina. So the president of Lumina at the time was able to say, oh, this is just a temporary thing. Zakia's not really going to leave. Like, and if she does try to leave, we'll try to you know, figure out a way to get her to stay. So thankfully, I was able to take a leave of absence. And the day afterwards, I realized that I was not completely out of a job, but was able to go back to Lumina. And that was only because I had good mentors. So the point of that story was just to have um, good mentors and people that you can ask for you know, advice in different transition periods in life. I worked on that transition, had that really devastating outcome for us, um, met someone there who was a young graduate student at Princeton. And um, she was super, we bonded, and I was a little bit older than her, had worked again in an administration before. She wanted to be in policy and politics, and particularly around education. Um, and I just told her, you know, pick yourself up, don't worry, go back to New Jersey. There'll be other things that come along, don't be too discouraged. She ended up working for Phil Murphy for governor. And uh, because she was in New Jersey, that was what she ended up doing next. I kept in touch by text, said, hey, you know, Merry Christmas, that kind of thing. And January of last year, out of the blue, she calls me and said, hey, do you have any interest in being the Secretary of Higher Education for the state of New Jersey? It's like, who is the governor of New Jersey? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and, um, no, I was like, oh, wow, let me talk to my husband. That's ne like literally never a thing that even crossed my mind before. Um, and within two and a half weeks of her calling me out of the blue. Um, I was in Trenton on State Street interviewing with Governor Murphy um, for this position. So and that is where my story <laughs> picks up here. And after a year, it's been a fabulous, um, mostly fabulous ride. I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist, so I tend to look on the bright side of things. But I do think it's been a, um, a great time. Um, some of you here who know me know that there have been things that have happened that have been better or, been, or worse in the past year, but we could maybe get into some of that next year um, after everything no, pans out. Uh, but it's been wonderful, and I've been thankful to have this opportunity. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions or talk a little bit more about any one of those things or Real Housewives, which is my other passion <laughs> in life. So. Oh, yes, I did meet Barack Obama a couple times. Um, he, uh, so when I got the job at the White House, which I kind of glossed over, so I got this job at the White House. Again, someone that I had worked with when you're at the Department of Education, you get to work a lot with the people at the White House. They need various things. One day, out of the blue, somebody asked me to coffee. And the president's education advisor asked me to coffee. I had, he had no, didn't say why. I didn't know if he was trying to have an affair with me or like give me a job. And I shouldn't say that. He's not, he's an upstanding person. He's never tried anything like that. I shouldn't say that, especially today. No, he, I just, I was meant to say he didn't, he did not come with an agenda. So we talked and we rambled for like an hour. And then at the end he goes, Mary Ellen is leaving her job. Um, she, uh, we're looking for her replacement. Are you interested? And it was like, oh my God. So Mary Ellen was a person who I also knew um, and that, just like that, like, would you be interested? I was like, yes, hell yeah, like, of course I would. Um, and she, uh, I talked to her, though, about the job, and she said, look, everybody thinks working at the White House is this big thing, and I'm like, it is. She's like, but you're not going to meet President Obama. That's not how this works. You're basically like, here's interns, and here's you. I'm like, that's fine. I know how this goes. That's totally okay with me. She's like, you're not going to meet the president. You may see him sometimes. You may get to go to events and stand around in the back. I'm like, that is fantastic. I actually didn't start that soon. It was a very long, I thought maybe they found somebody else. And then a year later, they called and they said, okay, we finally would like to offer you this position. Can you start in like two weeks or something? Um, and I had planned the first vacation that I had, you know, I hadn't been on vacation in like three years. And I had planned that vacation for that week <laughs> when they <laughs> wanted me to start. Um, so I did go on my vacation, but I started right after that. And then um, right when I started, they said, okay, so we have this really important regulation that's moving through called gainful employment. And we need you to brief President Obama on it um, like next month. And so I went from thinking this never gonna meet President Obama, never gonna happen to 
yes, having to go in and brief him on that. And then um, a few months later, um, there was another thing that he wanted to talk about. And I did get a chance to see him then. He was extremely intelligent, the most brilliant person I've ever worked for, um, present company excluded. Uh, and and um, he, uh, some people, some politicians and people like that are known for like not really, not really reading their materials. Maybe, you know, they've got a lot going on. So you talk to them and they kind of, they need a little bit more coaching about the issues. That was not him. Like, you know, he wanted a briefing on, I think it was college costs after one. That's the one I really remember. And college prices, not college costs, college prices. They called it college costs and it annoyed me, but it was really about college affordability. And he wanted to understand why college costs so much. It's like, this is a hard thing to put into a, you know, five page memo and less than 30 minute briefing. So I'm like stressing out, like how do you explain this to somebody, all these different moving parts. So I started out my usual, most students actually go to public colleges, not private colleges. So, you know, you're you know, if you're thinking about that cost, you need to readjust. Public colleges are mostly funded by the state, state legislatures. And he like stops me and he's like, I read the memo. <laughs> so, um, and I was a state legislator. So I understand how college financing works. I was like, oh, it was like a little bit of shock because that was what I had prepared to say. <laughs> And then I'm like, oh, and then like somewhere between relief, like, oh, he's a smart person. He read the memo. He understands this already. And like, oh, crap, he's like more advanced than what I thought I was going to be dealing with. Like, are we really ready to get into it? So, yeah. Yes. Oh, thank you. So I am only my only housewife franchises are Atlanta and Potomac. And New Jersey, I, but I haven't watched New Jersey since Teresa came back from prison. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm not up on the latest. <laughs> yes? Do you have any favorite projects that you worked on? In the past? In the past, what's up? Oh, man. I, well, so the, um, this has been really, I mean, Jokes aside, this has been a really um, fascinating and great experience for me, this current position, because I came in and I, I kind of, you know, you did the thing that you're always supposed to do, which is when you're looking for a new job, interviewing the person as much as you are interviewing yourself. So even though this was a fantastic opportunity, I kind of was like, I've seen how you can be in these positions and it can be really, really sucky, even though it seems like a really great position. You can be in a very conniving and cutthroat environment. It's just like, I've been through that stress and I just am not here for it. Um, and I wanted to know that there was like real substance. So he said, well, I'm, when I did the interview, I was like, well, what are you trying to accomplish? And he was, I think he had just had president, uh, the presidents for dinner like that week. So he had like higher education fresh on his mind. And he was like, well, you know, of course, got the free community college, which he had um, campaigned on and, you know, want to do that. And I had actually worked um, at Lumina with different states implementing free community college, but trying to do it in a smart way, like we were trying to give them money to be more inclusive of adults, um, trying to make sure that they didn't restrict it to just the highest achieving students really to like be more inclusive with that. I shared that with him. I was like, look, I think it can be a really great tool, but it can't be something that's so restrictive because if you do, you really cut out the people who it can most benefit. So I wouldn't want to be involved in something that, you know, goes this way rather than that way. And he was like, that's great. That sounds fantastic. I'm all for it. So I was like, okay, that's great. The other thing he said he wanted to do, so we've been implementing that, um, trying to expand that over the past year, which has been phenomenal um, as an opportunity. The other thing was that he said we need a state plan for higher education. I was like, oh man, that's such a great opportunity. And to actually come into a state where people feel like there needs to be a plan, you know, you know how it is when you're doing a plan and nobody wants there to be a plan. <laughs> And like people, y'all are in higher education, so you know how that is. So I came in and like you talk to people there. And when I talk to other people, I talk to, um, you know, the former president of this institution. I talked to, you know, folks who were like, yeah, we need a plan. And I was like, OK, so there are people here who actually want there to be a plan. And I would be coming in trying to help develop a plan. So that seems like a good match rather than. So both of those things, it was um, even though they haven't really been easy, it's been exciting. And I would say, dare I say, fun to work on because it's not as, um, even though not, you know, there's always going to be challenges and stuff that you're going through. In general, there's like, in, there's momentum and enthusiasm and not just like outright resistance to everything. Yes. Throughout your career, how have you seen the challenges of 
Yeah. So um, that's actually a really great question because I think the question was like, how do you maintain the passion for what you're doing? Sometimes we can be so like in our zone that you kind of forget what am I doing this for? And even working in the White House or something like that, you can be working on these projects that you're like, I think about this when I was at the advisory committee, you're working on a report that's about, you know, and even though it seems like it's important, you can, you're like in the data cells and you're in the like, you know, going back and forth on revisions and you're like, does this really matter? Is anybody going to read this? Is this going to like have any impact? Um, so there, there are, um, there's one thing that I really try to do, which is to maintain some connection, whether it's um, doing something in my personal life, like tutoring, mentoring, something here, I don't have as much time, and frankly, I don't know as many people. <laughs> so I um, really enjoy going to colleges and talking to students. Um, and that's a way to like, okay, this is why you're doing this. This is like why when we're going through the like umpteenth cover of, you know, the state plan or trying to do a meeting, like should it be where, remember we had a meeting, is it where, the name of the state plan is where opportunity meets innovation? It's like, should it be where innovation meets opportunity? Or should it be, <laughs> like, and it's like, why the hell is this important? It's like, okay, no, f come back, focus, it's about the students, it's about the fact that we're trying to do something that pr provides a cohesive thing. So taking a step back every so often and really talking to people or engaging in some way with whoever, like whatever the thing is that you care about engaging in some way. Um, and then when I take, when I, and again, I will acknowledge not everybody has the luxury to do this when looking at jobs, but I try not to just look, I try not to look for jobs because they seem like they're important. I've tried to look at opportunities and say, is this something where I think I can add value? Like, what is it that I think I do well? Because that's where I, you know, people thrive, you know, when you're doing something that you do well and you're, so I enjoy teaching and I've always enjoyed teaching. I'm like talking to people, like, you know, they're, anyway, we won't get into my little personal resume of stuff I like, but there's stuff that I know that I can do well. There's some things that I feel like, you know, somebody needs to do that, probably not me. And, um, I don't want to divulge like, you know, some position that I, because I mentioned that like these positions kind of were things that people presented, but there were things that people, and I won't divulge because there are people that are in those positions now or whatever, but there were things that people presented with me, to, to me, that were potential career opportunities, but that weren't that right mix of, and you know, who knows, I could have taken it and it been fine, but I really try to think about, mm, is this something where I feel like I could be, I could be good at it and where I am I think one of the best people to do it. And there have been things, especially in that kind of cutthroat, I will say like somebody, they asked me to come back to the White House after I had been at Lumina and President Obama was in his second term, they, um, somebody asked me to come back to work in the White House, this time in a more senior role in the White House than what I was previously in. And so again, I went back to that mentor and I was like, oh my gosh, this is such a great opportunity. And she's like, well, what would you be doing? And I was like, well, I don't really know. She was like, well, you've done the job where you didn't really know what you were going to be doing. <laughs> and you worked in the White House and you like, so what's the benefit of going back to doing that? And I was like, well, I would be working for so-and-so. And she was like, look, I know you worked in the White House and you think that's a big deal. But to everybody else on your resume, it says you worked at the White House. And unless you personally are going to be getting something else from that experience, you've already got that. So the thing that you go to work for the White House to do is, which is in part, to like get that experience, you already have it. And you're not gonna get, people aren't gonna look at your resume again being like, oh, she went back again. Like, it's not, that's, no, you're not gonna get an extra bump from that. So unless you're really feeling like you're, you have something to add, to contribute, that's gonna make you passionate, you're probably just gonna go back and be angry and frustrated and whatever. And I think if I had gone back and done that second tour, especially because, oh, bless you, um, I could have, I was starting my doctoral prog program at the time and I knew why I wanted to do the doctoral program, um, which I'm not recommending necessarily as a, as a thing to do, but I was excited about it and knew why I wouldn't do it and was finally at a place in a career where I had enough time um, in my job where I could do it, which is not always, as you all know, the case. She was like, you would be giving up. You're not going to be able to do a doctorate while working at the White House. So is it worth you going and getting whatever you think you're going to get? Or are you going to be working on something fantabulous like, I don't, I don't know what it would have been, right? But like, are you gonna be working on some integral project that is going to be, you know, something that you were really hanging your cat on and it wasn't. And so I turned it down and I think the guy was like, what? Like, who gets approached about working? 
I would have probably been working a lot more closely with Barack Obama. So maybe, again, this could be a terrible, terrible <laughs> thing, right? Like maybe I was, would be running the Obama Foundation right now. If I, um, but it was just, um, it would have been closer to the inner circle, but it wouldn't have been doing anything I was passionate about, and it wouldn't have been, it would have been frustrating. And part of the reason I left was because I was tired and I was burnt out, and I would have been even more tired and burnt out. So I try to do things even at the front end where I'm thinking, okay, this is something where I feel like I can really contribute so that when you have those days when you're frustrated and tired, you can go back to it. And if you don't have anything to go back to, if you don't really know why you're doing it, then it's hard to kind of regain that energy. That's what I find. Yes. What did I write my dissertation on? Um, let me see if I remember the title. I know what the title was. Uh, it was about U.S. presidents and student loan policymaking. So it was about, um, it was a comparison of three different um, presidential administrations and their approach to student loan policy making. So it was a, um, more of a, pol like a, a political science dissertation than a higher education dissertation, but you know, whatever. It, and so I looked at different, there's different um, theories about how policies are made and um, I kind of looked at these different examples of different decision points that President Bush, Clinton, and Obama had around student loan policy and looked at the factors that impacted their decisions to make policy and it was, so I was able to draw on my personal experience and connections. So I did a bunch of um, obviously document review. I knew uh, I had the benefit of the fact that President Clinton's library, um, a lot of it you could find the uh, presidential libraries are online, the archives and stuff like that. Um, President Obama obviously didn't have a library that was online at the time, but Bush, there was a lot of archival documents. And then I had interviews that I did with people. And a lot of the people that were involved in their policymaking process were people I knew. And so I had like a 99% response rate on reaching out to people and getting them to talk to me um, for my dissertation, which was in incredibly helpful. So I basically had all of the key people that advised those presidents during the different times and was able to get their perspective. So it was. And I thought it was going to be useful in the next presidential <laughs> administration, and it wasn't. <laughs> so. Yes. Um, thank you for being here today, Madam Secretary. Thank and you. And for sharing your educational, yeah. professional, and some of your personal story with us. Can you talk um, to us about the um, biggest lesson you've learned mm. thus far and mm -hmm. about the greatest challenge you've mm. overcome today? Biggest lesson I've learned in general, not just in this job. Um, biggest lesson. You know what? Um, the biggest lesson has actually been one of humility. And whenever I face like a big challenge where I'm like, I just do not know what to do. I'm frustrated at work. There's something. And so take or leave this. I'm also I'm, uh, spiritual and religious. So when I face things, I often pray. And at each place where I can think about like major transitions where I was trying to figure out what do I do I wouldn't have gotten that first job if I hadn't been a little bit humble about what you know my aspirations were if I only took jobs based on the title and even the pay and like what it was going to present to me I would never have made that first leap which then led to everything else um, when I <laughs> funny as it sounds, I was really, really upset about the guy that came in and like wouldn't talk to me. It made me, because I feel like I'm a nice person, right? Like I don't think of myself as that annoying, you know, young person that's like telling you, I really felt like I was respectful, I was trying to be helpful, and um, I felt like super disrespected and like I was nothing, you know? Um, and so ironically, the advice that I got from my boss, which was to stop doing the work, like, she also was just like, don't, just chill. Like, this is about him, it's not about you. You're upset because you feel like you're more whatever, and if you just kind of take it down a notch, just be like, you know what, okay, he's the boss, he's in charge, I'm not in charge, whatever. It'll work itself out, and it did. And so every, I'm trying to think of some other times where that approach has like, if nothing else, it may not have gotten me ahead, but it made me feel more at peace with myself, um, which I find, these days to be more valuable than anything. Like if I am at peace with myself and like happy, then thankfully like I'm able to eat, right? I'm not like living hand to foot. I'm not, you know, worried about that kind of stuff. So on a day to day basis, if I can be just at peace, that's one of the things that helps me to then have energy to keep like doing stuff. So that was the biggest lesson for me was to sometimes like, if you can just be like, okay, 
not that I'm not that big of a deal. Like I'm just gonna try to, and it's not always about being a big deal, but my version of humility is like trying to take myself out of it. That's the big, biggest lesson. And I think the greatest challenge, um, it probably has been this past year. This past year, um, I, you know, had I moved from D.C. So I lived in D.C. for about ten years. I had built up this community, and Robin knows some of this. Um, um, but I had I built up this whole community in D.C. I got married. Um, we bought a house. We used to have our friends over like every weekend. I loved to cook. You know, I finally kind of gotten into a groove. I'm feeling like, you know, and then I get this call for this, and it's a great opportunity, but totally removed us from that community. And we have some family here, um, but you know, it's not the, you know, it's not the same as having a tribe type of friend. So the plus side I've been, again, I'm optimistic. So plus side is I've had a lot more time to spend with my family that I don't usually <laughs> spend time with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, we did. We, so we used to have Thanksgiving like five years ago and it's like now every weekend. <laughs> so, so, but, um, but on the, on the flip side, you know, just not being around that friend and having to start over, you know, in a place, um, and frankly, in a very different place. Like we live in South Jersey, not super far South, but you know, yeah, South Jersey, um, but in Medford, which is not the most diverse of places. And, um, we're from, not from, but I'm from Atlanta and we lived in DC, which are very, very diverse places. And so it's been a culture shock in that way. Um, I'm kind of fine because I'm actually an introvert and I don't really love talking to people. So I just kind of like do my gardening and cook inside. But for my husband who loves to talk to people and have friends and to go from being the place where people like spent time and hosting people every weekend to basically hanging out with our family and one another all the time was tough. And then my dad um, had uh, developed cancer suddenly, or I mean, we don't know if it's suddenly, but we found out suddenly about six months before I started the job. And so it was just, it kind of took our whole life off course. And so when I started, not only were we moving and having to change over our lives, but I was going back and forth to Atlanta a lot and spending time with my mom. Um, and then he passed away in June. So it was just a lot. And then that was also coincided with budget. <laughs> and um, so not only did I start the job, um, you know, great, excitement from the governor, but you know, very difficult budget negotiations. I, within I think a month of starting here, I was like in front of the legislature answering questions, still hadn't gotten my team together. There was a lot that we had to like, Ashley from her staff knows, like we were still trying to just, we were trying to hire people. We we're still trying to like, I was trying to figure out, you know, where's the bathroom? Who are all the presidents? Who are all of the legislators? Then you're getting asked questions about budget that frankly, you didn't really have that much to do with because you just started right before it got announced. And so that was a lot. And at the same time, to have this personal stuff going on, it's probably one of the most, and then to not be like, oh, I'm going to do this. And then on the weekends, I'm going to like hang out with my friends who lift me up. It was just extremely challenging, but got through it, which is why I'm so happy now. <laughs> because I felt like this year we had the plan. We had, like a, I felt like we had the budget stuff in place, but it was probably the most challenging personal part. Yeah. Yes. Um, what's something you really enjoy about the job you have now? Oh, I enjoy it so much. It doesn't have to be like, oh, this thing at work you do all the time. I really like that. It's like maybe people or. I feel like we have a really great um, team, like people that work in the office. Um, the other thing that I really enjoy is that I don't stay at work that late, like compared to my past jobs. And, oh my God, there's so many things I really do enjoy. Um, I like talking to students, so I, the fact that I get to talk to students on a fairly regular basis, um, but the people are just like nice people to be around, or maybe I think they're not, maybe, maybe actually are people really nice? Or like, <laughs> like, maybe it's because I'm the boss, <laughs> like everything reminds me of nice. Okay, Ashley works with us in the office. Um, um, the traffic, oh, it's so much better. <laughs> I'm, oh my god it is so much better like oh my god I lived in okay when I lived in DC I lived in um, uh, suburban Maryland I lived 11 miles from my office exactly it took me 45 minutes to an hour every single day to get one way to get to work 
Um, and it would have taken longer if I went on the highway. That was because I cut through the streets. And then it's like just a frustrating 45 minutes. It's not like a straight shot, you know, you're riding. It's like a stop and go, red lights, sitting for a long time, idling, going around, you know, people stop. It's just, it was nightmare. And so I love the fact that like, oh, I take 295. Sometimes I take 206. I'm like going past farmland and on the way home. It's just, I love it. I love, I love the commute. It's so beautiful and I see the sun setting. Or It's so beautiful, so I love that. So I know she's so wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So we wanna keep asking questions. So I wanna be mindful yeah. of everyone's time. And I just wanna say we are so appreciative that you came yeah, here to talk you. to us.